Good evening, and it is a blessing to me and to my wife as well to, to meet everyone here and get to worship the Lord together with you. It truly has been a <clears throat> great joy for us to take part in the fellowship that we have in the body of Christ as, as I have preached in the various congregations of our presbytery. Will you please turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I will read the first two verses. Please give attention to God's holy word as you hear it. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Let's ask the Lord to bless this word to us. Our Father in heaven, we do rejoice that you communicate to us your truth and your grace and peace as well through your word and particularly in, in this passage. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would now enlighten our minds in the knowledge of, of you and of the message of, of your word before us. We pray that you would enable us to understand and also then to go forth and live by your grace. And we ask that you would bless us in our service to you, that you would strengthen us for it in this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at the <clears throat> beginning of Paul's letter to the Colossians, he uses words that are very common throughout his writing. And you may be tempted to look at these words and skip over them because you've seen them so many times and, and even heard them from uh, in the worship service as God's greeting, the salutation. Yet they are in Scripture and multiple times at the beginning of Colossians and Paul's other letters, and for good reason. They do communicate to you, at, uh, as is expressed here at the end, grace to you and peace central blessings from God, which Paul wants you to receive. And they also are here because in order for you to receive that grace, you need for God to make a connection with you. That is why Paul then identifies himself as the author and you as the recipients in the form of, of greeting at the beginning of this book and then also he gives you a substantive Christian greeting, those three parts. Now, it is important for a connection like this to be made in order for you to receive <coughs> God's grace. At one point, a couple of years ago, my wife and I were preparing for our wedding, and we, uh, I, I invited my best friend from high school to serve as a groomsman in my wedding. I didn't give him quite enough time to, to make the decision or to uh, buy the ticket to come, and so I was a bit concerned that perhaps he wouldn't come. He was also stationed halfway around the world as an Air Force um, cargo pilot, C-130 pilot in Okinawa, Japan. And so the distance and the short amount of time that I gave him made me wonder whether he would really come. Well, as my uh, wife and I, wife-to-be at that point, were moving our belongings across the U.S. in the cell phone signal-deprived wasteland of Wyoming or Nevada. All of a sudden, I received two uh, voicemail messages on my cell phone, and, and so I wanted to listen to them and thought, maybe it's my friend, maybe it's Chris. So I listened to the first one, and there were two minutes of silence. I had to wonder, who is it? that tried to call me, and thankfully, when I heard the second message, it was Chris telling me, I'm coming to your wedding. And I, I had visions in my mind of him flying a C-130 around the world to Philadelphia to come to my wedding. I'm sure he rode on, on an airline instead. But inside, I was so delighted, just saying, yes, Chris is coming to the wedding. You see, the, the first call did not make the connection but the second one did, and it got the message through to me, and it had its right impact on me. I rejoiced. We also have great reason to rejoice 
at the message that God has for us in, in this book of the Bible and really in the whole Bible. Paul introduces his, his message in this book by in, informing you that it is intended to give you God's grace and also his peace. Well, let's then, let's seek to understand uh, how Paul makes a connection with us so that we can truly receive that grace and peace. Again, he speaks first of the author of this book, and second of the recipients, and then third, the greeting. The author, uh, he, he, uh, we can summarize his point this way about the author. He says, in effect, Jesus Christ sent Paul to you. He says it in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. That word apostle is simply from the, the Greek word that means to send. Paul was one who was sent by Jesus Christ. One sent, he says, by the will of God and with Timothy, our brother. In this, <clears throat> Paul is indicating uh, especially that he does not come of his own will, but he comes by the will of Jesus Christ. We should look then at why Christ sent Paul. What was Christ's purpose in sending Paul to us as the church and, and particularly here to the Colossians? Well, Christ's purpose in coming to this world is the foundation for why he sent Paul to the Colossians. We read of that in John 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. I, I uh, skipped there. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of the, the riches of God's mercy, out of the riches of God's own grace, the Father decided to send the Son to take on human flesh and to become a, a perfect man, to live in our place, to die in our place, to rise from the dead, to conquer death on our behalf. And for that reason, then, we now know that as, as Christ has, <clears throat> has served as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, we can receive the grace of forgiveness, of reconciliation with God, and, and now be counted as one of God's own sons as well. We who deserve His wrath now, by God's grace, receive His great kindness and mercy and care and providence and now communion and fellowship with God. Well, it was for this reason of bringing salvation through Christ's work and His life and death and now through the gospel sent forth by the apostles, through the apostles. And so it was for that purpose then that Christ sent out the apostles to convey this message that Jesus Christ has conquered sin and made a way for us now to be reconciled to God. Through Christ, we can now receive God's grace. And so Christ sent out the apostles as ambassadors, and Paul speaks of this function and of how great God's grace is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So now Paul is not coming with his own message. He is coming with the message of Jesus Christ. He describes himself with this word, apostle. Now, as we know, that word simply means that Paul was sent, but it also indicates that Paul had the special office of one who is sent specially by Christ. And there are two aspects of that, uh, that office which are important for us when Paul now tells us that he is an apostle. They are important because they give us a reason to listen to this message and to recognize that the grace that Paul speaks of truly is given to us through that message. 
we can see the, the two ways the apostleship is significant in the two qualifications for the apostles, uh, for the office of an apostle. First, an apostle had to be an eyewitness of Christ's resurrection, of Christ after he rose from the dead. We <clears throat> see that, that qualification on display as the apostles were discussing who could replace Judas after Judas out of um, guilt and uh, remorse for having committed, I mean, for uh, having betrayed Christ, he committed suicide, he needed to be replaced. In Acts 1.22, the apostles say, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. In that case, he is, uh, they were saying, this new replacement must be able to speak, to tell about the resurrected Christ. There is implicit in that, that uh, the person would need to be an eyewitness, just like the rest of the apostles. Peter confirms that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and following, and especially gives us a reason why it's important for eyewitnesses to be the ones to pass on the gospel to us. He says this, We did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Now there, Peter is not speaking of the post-resurrection Christ. He's speaking of the Mount of Transfiguration, that moment when Christ's glory was revealed. Yet, in speaking of that, he indicates the reason why an eyewitness is trustworthy. An eyewitness has, in fact, seen the reality that he testifies of. In a, in a court of law, even today, the best evidence you can provide is an eyewitness. The uh, less valuable evidence is circumstantial in nature. Uh, circumstantial evidence is, is evidence where someone didn't see you or see the accused commit the crime, but rather they merely can say, yes, I know that the car was in the driveway at this time, and so on. But here we have each of the apostles who saw that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And as Christ appeared to many others as well, we have great confirmation that in fact he is risen, and in fact he did conquer death. You have then in the Apostle Paul one <clears throat> given the truth as directly, as immediately as it can be given to anyone. A good reason then to trust that Paul is telling that truth. The second qualification for an apostle was that they had to be appointed by Christ and sent by Christ. And you see both of those aspects in Acts 26, when Paul recounts what Christ said to him on the Damascus Road. He says, and this is Christ speaking, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things which you have seen and to the things which I will show you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you. Now that is a personal uh, commission from Christ. Christ spoke personally to Paul and appointed him. He set him apart specially for this task of proclaiming the gospel. And then he sent him forth. Now, if someone who is perhaps in a charismatic church tells you that they are an apostle, you should remember that the original apostles recognized that a man who, who holds that title must be an eyewitness of Christ in the res his resurrected body and also appointed directly by Christ and sent out by him. A false apostle should not claim that name. But more importantly, because Paul was sent by Christ, set apart by him, he comes in Christ's name. He comes with Christ's authority. And he comes with Christ's message and also 
the grace which Christ's message brings. The gospel of repentance and faith in Christ is conveyed truthfully by the men whom Christ set out to, to proclaim it. And so Paul identifies himself as one who has that role, one who rightly carries the true message. And this is a good reason then for us to listen to what he has to say. If you had any question whether uh, Paul's motives were perhaps selfish or self-glorifying, he adds on that he comes by the will of God and with Timothy, our brother. In that, uh, I will not spend very much time on these two uh, parts of verse 1, but in his statement that he comes by the will of God, you should remember why Paul became an apostle. He did not come by his own, uh, he did not become one by his own decision by his own desire to proclaim that Christ is the Savior. In fact, when Paul was converted, he was actively and, and harshly persecuting Christians. Christ himself said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And why do you kick against the goads? In other words, why do you so strongly resist me? In fact, Paul was an evil man. He was fighting Christ and killing Christ's people, when Christ then took him and transformed him, he appeared to him on the Damascus Road and called Paul to repent of that sin, and then immediately told Paul, I will send you out to preach the gospel that salvation is in me alone, in Christ alone. Amazingly, even though Paul in himself was not qualified for this task, Christ set him apart for it and sent him out to accomplish it. Christ then did make Paul, by his grace, more and more faithful as a, pro, a proclaimer of the gospel of Christ. Paul did not come by his own decision, not out of some own uh, humanly originated philosophy, not out of some empty deception like was being preached in the Colossian church, like the men who uh, were false teachers in Colossae, but unlike them, Paul came by the will of God, not due to any selfish motive. And, and Paul then also mentions Timothy, the brother. And uh, when you look at what Timothy did throughout the New Testament, you don't see him writing books or letters. And so this does not appear to be a reference to Timothy as a co-author of the book, but rather what Timothy did under Paul's authority was he would be sent out for a, a, a short period of time as a missionary pastor to strengthen churches that, that Paul often would, would plant and then he would leave Timothy there for a time. And then Paul would move on to another church and then call Timothy to come and, and now work at another uh, church plant. And so what this implies is that Paul's message in this book is not merely Paul's. It's not just the one that Paul preaches, but it is also the one that Timothy preaches. It is also the one that all of the churches planted by Paul and supported by Timothy and, and the other co-workers of Paul, which they all preach. This is the received truth, the, the one known by all of God's people, all who believe in Christ. If you uh, perhaps think that this message even today proclaimed of, of the, go, uh, the gospel in this congregation is just of uh, local interest. You know, it's just what your pastor has made up. Or if you think that it is interesting to come and, and listen to what is said tonight, but it is not going to make uh, any difference to the people that you know from day to day during the week, recognize here this truth proclaimed in God's word and as well, so far as my words are faithful to it, this is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's true for all men and as well should be received by all. Paul then goes on and identifies who the recipients are. You see, he speaks to the Colossians and deals with some of the objections they might have to listening to this message of, of grace and peace from God. 
they had some reasons not to listen to Paul. For, for one, and it's uh, fitting that I mention this in, in connection with the fact that you have not yet met me, they had not yet met Paul. And so you could expect that they, they might wonder, who is this man, Paul? I've never met him, and he's writing me a letter. And also, I don't, I don't uh, know him. He doesn't know what's uh, unique about my life. The Colossian church was planted by Epaphras, who was one of Paul's converts. There uh, were a few people in Colossae who had met Paul, but the rest had not. So who is this man? You know, I, I know the false teachers here in Colossae far better. And what's more, their message is more interesting. That's the second and probably greatest reason why they, they uh, might not have wanted to listen to what Paul had to say. The false teachers in Colossae were <clears throat> mixing together a, a combination of Jewish legalism and pagan uh, nature worship and also philosophical speculation about what the, the basic parts and realities of the world are, the basic principles of the world, as Paul terms them. And this philosophy very likely was, was interesting, so much more interesting than what this foreign man, Paul, has to say. And lastly, Colossae was uh, a small town and, and in some ways a cultural and economic backwater. It wasn't, it wasn't right on the beaten path in the Greco-Roman world. And so if, if you know what it's like to, um, I, I don't know how you view Modesto compared to, say, the Bay Area or, or um, Los Angeles, but I, I grew up in a rural area in eastern Washington, and when people came from Seattle or, or from um, California as well, people would comment about their driving and, and other aspects, especially when someone comes from a big city to a small one. You can wonder, will that big city person care about us little people? Do they really understand what it's like here? The Colossians could have thought the same way. And so Paul reminds the Colossians of who they are. And you need to know that as well. You, in fact, are the same kind of people as these Colossians when you look at how Paul describes them. And because of who they are, the message of this book is specially for them and for you. Paul tells them, this letter is addressed to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Now, he does mention Colossae, and so if he were writing to you, uh, he, he would put in the word Modesto here. But how does he describe the Colossians? Does he first say, you are painters and carpenters and farmers and, and so on? He doesn't identify them that way. He reminds them, you are saints, you are faithful brothers, and you are in Christ as well. You uh, very likely, I know I am from day to day, you can easily be tempted to identify yourself with the, the people where you live or the TV shows that you watch. It's, uh, it's amazing to me to, to recognize that many television shows present a lifestyle to you, an attractive lifestyle. Now, of course, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple say the OC. I haven't watched it uh, at all, actually, but I've seen advertisements for it. It, it strikes me as uh, advertising a lifestyle of being young and attractive and, and maybe intelligent, living where it's warm and sunny all the time and, and you get to do uh, fun things on the beach. Wouldn't that be great to live that way? Along with, I'm sure, there, there are all kinds of moral problems that people on the, uh, the characters on the show are involved in. The show presents a lifestyle to you. Are you tempted to follow after a worldly lifestyle presented to you and forget that at the core of who you are, you are a saint, a faithful brother in Christ? Paul tells them that, in fact, you are a saint. He doesn't mean that you are perfectly holy right now, but he does mean that the Holy Spirit has begun to work in you to transform you from one who is utterly committed to doing what is opposed to God 
to one now who is being sanctified, who more and more wants to serve God from your heart. Now, if that is true of you, then remember that is your identity. If it's not yet true of you, then you need to recognize that this message is, <clears throat> is one that can transform you from one who is identified fully with the world to one now who is identified with Christ, the Savior. This is a message that can change you from one who is evil to one who rightly can be called a saint. Paul then even says, not only did you experience conversion at one point in time and then just go back to your worldly way of life, but you have become faithful brothers in Christ. Because you are united to Christ, He continues to work in you to make you faithful, to continue to be faithful to your Savior. Now, if you are tempted to identify first with <clears throat> this world and not with Christ, Paul is seeking to reorient you. One way to summarize the, the uh, point that he's making here in verse 2 is that just as Christ sent Paul to you, and so you should hear this message that he's going to proclaim, so also you are Christ's church. You belong to Christ, specially. He's begun to work in you. You now depend on Him in order to, to receive the, the growth and the life that is at the core of your being and of your, uh, your experience now. So Paul addresses you as saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Now that he has identified that he is one who carries the message you need to hear, and also that you are the ones to whom the message is intended and who need the message, what then is the message which he has to, to give to you? The end of verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. I don't really desire to rephrase that statement in another way of putting the point. Here, Paul tells you that at the center of what this whole book is about, of Colossians, at the center even of uh, <clears throat> the message that Paul proclaims, so even other books and even of the whole Bible, is this. God wants you to receive grace and peace and to receive it from God our Father. Now, I want you then to, to learn more of what this grace is and the resulting peace. I want you to uh, <clears throat> learn a, a brief definition of what God's grace is so that when you look again at these words at the beginning of a, a book of Scripture or when you um, read God's Word in this letter or elsewhere, look to find God's grace and to receive it. I want you to recognize what it is that is at the core, uh, one, one of the blessings at the core of this book. A brief definition of God's grace is this. In four words, it is God's unmerited favor, and it's expressed in His condescending care. Unmerited favor and condescending care. Now, that word condescending may uh, throw you off. I, I just want you to know right off, it doesn't mean that God is seeking to insult you. That's not the issue. We'll look at that in, in a second. But first, it is his unmerited favor. And I will start with that word favor. First off, God's grace is his favor toward you. It's his disposition that is kind toward you. It's within himself <clears throat> as... Uh, Colossians 1.13 says, We are now in the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Because we are in that kingdom, because we are united to the Son of God whom God loves, we now receive God's love, which He, he expresses toward His Son, and as God's Son now covers our guilt with His righteousness, we can receive this, this love of God toward us. It is also unmerited favor. And to define that, it means 
God's favor toward us is not one which we deserve. It's not something that we merit because of how good we are. John Murray says that God's grace is not only his favor to the undeserving, but it's his, his favor to the ill-deserving. It's not just a neutral standing that we have before God outside of his grace, but also it's even more God's favor toward the hell deserving. We do deserve, apart from God's grace, to suffer the, the full wrath of God. Paul uh, tells us in, <clears throat> in Colossians 1.21 that we once were alienated from God, that is, and, and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. As the Old Testament tells us, our sin has separated us from God. We do not deserve to be in God's presence because He is perfectly holy and, and just and good, yet we are evil, and our evil alienates us from Him. <clears throat> if you are in that position now, and if you have not yet asked God to forgive you for your sins, you are in that position. If you have not yet trusted on Christ for salvation, you have begun to experience this alienation that Paul speaks of. And I will warn you, that alienation from him will only grow greater. In hell is the final and fullest alienation from God. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you cannot know peace with God. In fact, you are at enmity with God. But if you're in that position, you need to know the second part of God's grace. And as well, if you're a, a believer, you do need to grasp how great God's grace is. You see, it is also His condescending care. Now that word condescending here <clears throat> contrasts with the, the fact that God's favor is something within His own heart. It's not only within Himself, but He also comes down to us who don't deserve it, and He expresses it to us. He gives it to us. He, he takes the first step in reaching out to us. Even though we don't want to turn away from our sin, He comes and transforms us. He gives us a heart that desires now to turn away from sin because we are convicted by the Spirit that our sins are evil and wrong. We now desire to serve our God. That is great grace from our God. He has reconciled us in Christ's body of flesh by his death, according to Colossians 1.22, <clears throat> in order to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You see, even before you were born, God sent Christ to die in order to accomplish your reconciliation with God. He took the first step in that historical uh, event, but he also takes the first step in your experience. Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5 and 8 and 9 and 10 make it very clear that <clears throat> it was when we were dead in our sins. That means when we were unable to, to lift a finger, to stop sinning, unable to, to do anything to <clears throat> stop our trespasses against his law, when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. There we recognize one aspect of God's grace that it, in, it, it means that God takes the first step. He takes the first and definitive step in transforming us to, to be reconciled to Him. Ephesians 2.8 makes it clear that that first step was not our doing but God's. He says... Uh, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. God reaches down to you. That's what we mean by this word condescend. God comes down even to meet you who are a sinner and me and takes you and cleanses you, transforms you to no longer be a rebel, but be one who worships and submits to the true and living God. If you have not yet received uh, that blessing of trusting on Christ through faith, God calls you to, to 
uh, call on the name of the Lord. And the promise is that all who do that will be saved. To call out to Jesus Christ and to God the Father, save me on the basis of the fact that Jesus Christ has died to take the penalty for my sin. Save me by your power, not by mine, for your glory and not for mine. Recognizing here that God does delight to come down and take that first step to save us. It is his condescending care. And in that word care, you see that God does not desire to, to leave his, <coughs> his uh, ones whom he is going to save without any help in this world. He does not desire to leave us to our sins or to the punishment that, that our sins deserve, but in fact, he cares for us. He, he expresses concern, but, but more than that, he gives us what we need in providing, even as, as Ephesians 2.8 said, providing faith for us as a gift from him. All that you need in salvation, God now provides to you by uniting you to your Savior, Jesus Christ. God's grace, then, is his unmerited favor, but also, and I think even more gloriously, it's his condescending care in saving us. Now, will you then turn to this God? Whether you are a believer or an unbeliever at this moment, turn to him now. Trust him to to bless you by His grace as He has made Christ the atoning sacrifice, the one Savior through whom you can now receive the <clears throat> uh, freedom from the, the corruption of your sin, the guilt of it, the power of sin over your heart. God offers this grace to you. And the result, as, as Paul uh, mentions it immediately following, is in the end of verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, if you remain alienated from God, you cannot have friendship with Him. You cannot have His help, His care for you. You cannot know His favor toward you. But if you do now receive God's grace through faith in Christ as your Savior, you can know peace with God. You can now rejoice in Him and come freely before His throne as, as we even did tonight in prayer to Him. You can praise Him with your own lips and He will receive those praises and delight in them. You can also ask Him for what you need and pray in, in accord with His Word and ask for those things that He desires to give you and He will delight to bless you when you ask for the things that, that He uh, promises to provide you now can have peace with God. And we do, all who are united to Christ. We rejoice that we have this peace and in it fullness of joy and blessing in our uh, now <clears throat> restored communion with God, our Father. God has canceled the record of debt which stood against us. In Colossians 2.14 it says that this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and also in Colossians 1.20, Christ, uh, through Christ, God has reconciled us to himself, making peace by the blood of his cross. I, I want to exhort you then, as, as you read these words that you see at the beginning of uh, Colossians and the other epistles of Paul, and, and also when you look at any passage of, of Scripture, remember that these words are conveyed to you by the Apostle Paul, or, or by a man and uh, by a means appointed by God to convey the truth to you with authority so that you can receive it. Remember uh, that Christ sent Paul to you. Remember also that you are Christ's church. You are the ones to whom this message of God's grace is intended, for whom it is, it is intended, and to whom not only is the message given, but that grace as well is given to you. And remember also this core uh, reality, this uh, most important aspect of Paul's message, that through all that you read in Colossians, you should receive God's grace, His unmerited favor, expressed in His condescending care. 
and also peace with God your Father. Let's take a, <clears throat> a moment or two to reflect on what this passage has taught us and then we will uh, pray and, and respond with, with praise to our God with hymn 460. Let's take a moment to meditate on what God has said in this word. <clears throat> 